Good morning. A debt we couldn't repay for those men and women that gave their lives for our country. And a debt we couldn't repay for the life that Jesus gave for us. Hmm. We're going to be talking about a passage of Scripture in 1 Peter 5 today concerning elders. And Pat thought it might be more appropriate for an elder to give the message rather than a pastor. We'll know in about 40 minutes if that was wise or not. <laughs> but have you ever wondered why God has put so many authorities into our lives? You're born and immediately you have the authority of your parents. And then you go to school and you have teachers, principals, deans, oh deans. <laughs> then you go to work and you get into the work world and you've got layers and layers of bosses. And you've got policemen, judges, government officials. You get married. You have a husband that's over you. And then you come to church and you have the elders. You ever wonder why? As I grew up, I wasn't a big fan of authority. Pretty much any authority. And it seemed like every authority in my life wanted to take away my freedom, wanted me not to pursue my own pleasures and agendas. And so I grew up pretty rebellious. And as my authorities gave me more rules, I became more rebellious. And so because of this, um, I often found myself at the wrong end of my father's belt. I uh, spent a significant time being grounded, in which case I would sneak out and get caught, usually because I was ratted out by my brothers and sisters, by the way. Thank you for that. And then I would find myself at the end of the belt again and grounded. So my official grounding actually la lasted until about five years ago. <laughs> my wife, Bonnie, promised my mother that she would keep that grounding in effect. So, but then there was also a matter of uh, the judicial system. I, I had a few traffic tickets over my first couple of years of driving, and uh, the judge in downtown Chicago actually knew me by name. So. That's how I felt about the authorities in my life. As I got older, I rebelled against society's uh, morals and norms, and uh, we won't go into that. But it wasn't until I became a Christian that I began to see the benefit of authority. And even after I saw the benefit of authority, it took me years to learn the lessons of submission. And so some of you may feel that way about our elders. Why do I have to listen to them? What advantages for me to submit to them? The text we're going to look at today in 1 Peter actually gives us a unique perspective on elders. I think it gives us a window into the heart and mind of God on why he established elders. So keep that thought in mind. I'm going to kind of take a little rabbit trail here that will bring us back to this point. There's a couple of major themes that run through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, the most obvious is holiness, but the other one is suffering. We see that theme throughout this whole letter. And there's some things about suffering that I think are common to most of us. Um, it makes us lose perspective on the big picture of things. 
we tend to hone in on the specifics, the minutia of our suffering, and we lose sight of what else is going on. I think it also causes us to feel sorry for ourselves. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're the only ones that are suffering. Sometimes it leads to us to blame others for our suffering, and that can lead to bitterness, to anger. So suffering has a lot of play in our lives and with our emotions. And as we go through this letter, Peter has given us a number of encouragements as we face suffering. I'm going to read some of those to you. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that, here's the reason, the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, so this suffering, these trials, are testing our faith by fire, and it may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus comes back. So Peter gives us the big picture here that take your eyes off the suffering that's in front of you and look towards what's coming. Then in chapter 2, verse 20, oops, chapter 2, he says this, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it patiently, endure it, this finds favor with God. So he encourages us who are going through suffering, says, when you're doing it for what's right, it finds favor with God. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. So we may see ourselves as suffering, but from God's perspective, he sees us as being blessed. Then we go into chapter 4, and Peter gives us more encouragement, but this time it's with people. And we talked about it last week, the first one. In chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says this one, as each one has, Peter, says this, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Pat said that these spiritual gifts are given by God to help us to walk through the suffering. The gifts, gifts of speaking that encourage us, that teach us, and gifts of serving to help minister to us as we're going through difficulties. And then later on in that chapter, in verse 14, he says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Here's why you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So God's spirit rests on us as we're going through these trials. He gives himself to us as we go through trials. And then the last verse in that chapter says, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in what is doing right. So we've got a faithful creator that's going to walk us through this suffering. So those are the, the helps and the encouragement that Peter's given us up to this point. Then we come to chapter 5, which we're going to look at this morning, and it starts with the word, therefore. 
and it looks back into chapter 4. Therefore, because we're suffering as Christians, and he starts to give us this teaching on elders. And I think what Peter's doing is he's saying, you know what? The elders in this context have been given to the congregation as a gift to help them walk through the suffering. It's a little different perspective than we're used to. So let me read this text, and then we'll pray. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So Peter's identified with these elders. And also a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Now as I read the rest of this, I want you to look for three things. Three commands that Peter gives. One to the elders, one to young men, and the third to the congregation. So look for that. Shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Father, as we look at your holy word today, Father, would you take this word and through the Holy Spirit, transform us. Renew our minds. Fathers, there's commands given to different people in this. May we be obedient to those commands. Lord, I pray for those that might not have a high view of their elders. God, would you touch their hearts this morning. Father, I pray for the elders. I pray for myself as an elder. Would you change us in the way we view our flock? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Elders, given as shepherds. In Acts 14, 23 and Titus 1, 5, we're told that elders were appointed in every church. That would be small house churches, may have a half a dozen people, to large congregations. But every church was given elders. And we're going to see in this text the responsibility of those elders. Peter says, I exhort the elders among you. Remember this letter was written to maybe hundreds of churches over a vast area. It wasn't in one city, it was over a vast area. And so he's talking to every elder under different conditions with different congregations. And he says, I exhort you as your fellow elder. What Peter's about to say to the elders, he's lived out. This isn't something that's theoretical that he's made up. He's lived it out. He also says that he witnessed the sufferings of Christ. Now, I don't think he's saying that to put himself above the rest of the elders. I think he's saying, listen, I have seen the suffering of Christ, and I've used Jesus in this letter as an example on how to suffer well. And so I've seen that firsthand. Peter gives the first command to the elders. 
shepherd the flock of God among you. That word shepherd has a number of different meanings. One is to feed. Actually, the King James translate is to feed. It means to feed, to rule, to nourish, to tend. And as I thought about that, shepherding the flock of God takes on a number of different roles. It depends on where the flock is, where the individual sheep are. Sometimes they need to be fed. Sometimes they need to be brought back. Sometimes they need to be nursed back to health. And so this word shepherd has a lot of different meanings. In fact, in John 21, if you remember this, Jesus is speaking to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me more than the rest of these? Peter says, you know I do, Lord. And he says, well, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And then Jesus says to Peter a second time, do you love me? Peter's getting exasperated, and he says, yes. He says, then shepherd my sheep. And then he asks him a third time. And he says, feed or tend my sheep. So even the instruction to Peter has these different words that have a different aspect of shepherding the flock. I think first and foremost, the flock need to be fed. The main difference in the qualifications between a deacon and an elder is that elders must be able to teach. And the sheep need to be fed the Word of God on a consistent basis. And it's the elders' responsibilities to do that. And it may be in different contexts. It may be one-on-one -on -one in counseling. It may be in a small group setting. It may be in our pathways. It may be from the pulpit. But the idea is that it's the responsibility of the elders to feed the sheep. Pete, can you put up the slide? Let's see if I can read this. This is Paul talking to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, now, you, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and perseverance. And then a couple verses later, he says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. So, Timothy learned things from Paul, but he also had the Word of God from a youth. And he says, look at the last verse here. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for these things, for teaching. We need to teach the Word of God. For reproof, that means spanking. Sometimes the Word of God spanks us. Sometimes it corrects us, and sometimes it trains us in righteousness, in the way we walk. And so elders need to be acquainted with the book so they can shepherd and feed the flock in whatever sense they need it. Elders are also to rule or govern. They set the vision for the church. They set the expectations. They ensure that the flock lives by the principles and instructions set out in the Word of God. They're the governing leaders in the church. If you go back into Acts 15, called the Council of Jerusalem, it may be the most important council ever called in church history. The gospel had just started to spread, and some of the believers were the Jewish priests and Pharisees. And so they claimed 
that in order to be saved, you had to be circumcised and you had to keep the law of Moses. And Paul and Barnabas argued against them and they couldn't come to an agreement. So they went up to Jerusalem where the church had its main headquarters, if you will. And they brought it to the apostles and the elders. I find that interesting. Why would the apostles need to bring in elders to make this decision? But if you read Acts 15, over and over again, it's the apostles and the elders that made the decision. And they made a good decision <laughs> that probably changed what could have been the course of the church, that you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and that alone, and you need not be circumcised. And so that decision was made by elders and apostles. And so that is another function, if you will, of the elders. Thirdly, they're to care for the flock. Hebrews says they're to watch over your souls. When you're hurting, they're there to comfort. When you're suffering, they're there to give hope. That's what Peter's doing in this letter, giving hope for those that are suffering. When you're straying, they help you come back. When you're deceived, they bring truth. Peter's going to use three contrasts to tell elders how they're to shepherd the flock. Let me read the next couple of verses. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. That's the first contrast. So, this oversight literally means to look upon or to care for. And I have to be honest here, as, as I'm going to talk to the elders about this, God spoke to me about this. If we're going to be elders that rule well and care well and tend well, we need to know our flock, to look over them to know their strengths, their weaknesses, their giftedness. Every sheep is unique. Everyone in this congregation has different needs, different strengths, different gifts, and they're in different times of their lives. We need to know the flock well enough to know what they need at any given time. But Peter says that you're to exercise oversight not under compulsion. That's kind of strange. I mean, here at Moraine, we don't say, you, you got to be an elder. What's Peter talking about there? Why would an elder be under compulsion, unwilling? A couple of things come to mind. One is, that maybe an elder wants to be an elder for the stature. Really doesn't have a heart for the flock, but it's a position that has some respect to it. Or maybe there's an expectation of his friends, his wife, to be an elder. And Peter says, Don't do it. (laughs) Don't do it. Because if you're going to do it under compulsion, if you're going to do it reluctantly, you're not going to shepherd the flock well. The contrast is to do it voluntarily, according to the will of God. It's not about ego. It's not about expectations of others. It's about the will of God. 
Look at this verse, Acts 20. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. A couple of things here. Keep that up, Pete. A couple of things here that struck me. One is, it's the Holy Spirit that has selected the elders. Now here at Moraine, we have a nominating committee that nominate men to be elders. And then we take it to the elder board. And then we bring it to the congregation. And there's votes and votes and more votes. In all that process, we believe it's the Holy Spirit that appoints men to eldership. And that's what the Word of God says. It's the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but elders are appointed to shepherd the church which was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Talk about a high calling. But for you that think the elders are a pain in the butt, know that they're appointed by God. So your issue is not with the church or with the elders, it's with the Holy Spirit that's done the appointing. God knew that the church needed elders, and he took it upon himself to do the appointing. Second contrast. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Sordid gain, greedy for money. One of the qualifications for both elders and deacons is they're not fond of sordid gain. This is an interesting instruction here. The overwhelming number of elders were not paid. They were volunteers, just like we are here at Moraine. And so why would Peter say, not for sordid gain? Because it's a position of authority that can be misused. Men can make their flock feel obligated to them. Feel like they're owed something by them. And so Peter says, don't do that. You are not to use this position, the position you've been appointed to, that Jesus has purchased with his blood for sordid gain, but with eagerness, with eagerness. I'm going to change from talking about elders and, and make this one personal. My take on this is that God has called me to watch over his purchased people. Honor, privilege, unbelievable. And knowing my background, <laughs> that I shared a little bit of, but I left the sordid part out, why would God appoint me to watch over his purchased flock? Amazing grace. Amazing grace. And so it's a privilege, and it's something that I know I'm not capable of doing apart from the Holy Spirit of God. God, I, I can't even get to know the flock well enough unless the Spirit of God empowers me to do that. Third contrast. This one you guys will like. Not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Elders aren't to be little kings running around giving orders, demanding obedience and submission. Peter reminds the elders that the flock has been allotted to their charge. This isn't something they decided. It was assigned to them, and it was assigned to them by the chief 
shepherd by the one who gave his life. There's not an inherent authority in the elders. It has been given to them by Jesus Christ. And they will give an account for the way they govern. It's similar, I think, to the way we're called to be stewards of everything that God's given us. God gives us gifts, money, talents, and we're going to be responsible, accountable to how we use them. The same way, the elders are going to be stewards of the flock of God. And instead of lording it over the flock, you're to prove, prove to be examples. Elders, if you want to influence your people, model Jesus before them. Model how to walk with God. How to walk through suffering, trusting God to be the one that takes you through it. Model for them how you love Jesus with all your heart, mind, and strength. I think it's similar to being married. The husband's ahead of the wife, but if he acts like a dictator, things will not go well. Now, I don't know this personally. Some of my friends have told me that. So. <laughs> but if we're an example, if we're servants to our wives, things go much better at home. And I think it's the same way in the church. The elders are called to be examples, not dictators. And so they model humility, servanthood, what it means to have a love relationship with Jesus. Well, elders, now that I've beat you up, here's the good news. Here's the good news. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. There's a reward for those that shepherd the flock well. That's good news. It really is. Elders see a lot of the garbage that sin brings into people's lives. We see the destruction of sin in individuals, in marriages, in divisions in the church, in, in leadership that falls, a lot of stuff that we don't want to see. I remember the first time I came on the elder board, some of the people at Moraine did not look as good on the inside as they looked on the outside. And I remember that was shocking to me because I just sat in a congregation. Everybody looked nice here. But then you saw how sin impacted people's lives. I remember thinking, I want to go sit in the last row of the balcony and hide. I don't want to see all this junk. And so we see a lot of that stuff. And yet the good news is there's a reward coming. And so hang in there, elders. Hang in there. All right, second command. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. Why does he single out young men? He doesn't say young people. He says young men. And I'm going to give you my read on it from two perspectives. One, I remember being a young man. Two, I've talked to a lot of you young men. And young men think they know it all. <laughs> young men think they're smarter than their elders and wiser than their elders. They think they can run the church better than their elders. And they think the decisions we make are stupid. I've heard most of those, by the way, <laughs> said out loud. And so the instruction here is to be subject to your elders. It means to rank under. Put yourself under the authority of your elders. 
And again, this is the Holy Spirit speaking, not Dave Perrell. Remember that. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, Pete. And this actually is written to all of us. But I'm applying it to the young men. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. So that's what elders do. They watch over our souls. But they'll give an account. But look at this instruction. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. Why? For this would be unprofitable for you. Not for the elders, for you. Young men, <laughs> rank under your elders. I'll come back to that a little later in the, uh, when we talk about the uh, application. Third instruction. This is to everyone in the congregation. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Clothe yourselves with humility. This word clothe means it was a piece of clothing that a slave would wear. And the reason the slave would wear it is to distinguish himself from a free man. So if you were walking down the street of Rome, you would know from the garment that the slave wore that he was a slave. And so when you communicated with him, you would know who he was. And so the instruction to us is to put on this garment called humility that will distinguish us as slaves of Jesus Christ and as different from the world. It's supposed to be an identifying mark as a believer. Many Christians come across as arrogant and self-righteous. I think because we know the truth, we're, we're, we're not being thrown back and forth with the truths of the culture. We know the truth, and we also know the person of Jesus Christ. But instead of being arrogant about that and self-righteous, Peter says, clothe yourself with humility. You know, it's only by the grace of God that any of us came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we can boast about in that. And so Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And then he gives us the reason. For God is opposed to the proud. This is a frightening picture. God setting himself against the proud. Why is pride so obnoxious to God? Let me show you two Proverbs. Pete, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate, says God. And then look at this next section. No, no, I'm sorry. Stay there, Pete. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding power is mine. The proud think they have their own wisdom, their own understanding, their own power. They do not acknowledge the power of God in their lives. And God says, I set myself against those type of people because counsel is God's and sound wisdom and understanding comes from him. And there's a second reason, a second proverb. This one's a familiar one. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. It is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. The thing that caught my attention there is that last phrase. Then to divide the spoil with the proud. You know what happens? with proud people, not only do they not see the need for God's counsel 
and God's wisdom in their lives, but they see themselves as better than other people. They're dividing the spoil. Well, who's the spoil from? The weaker, those that can't fight back. And so there's this pride on two levels, one towards God and one towards people. And God says, I set myself against those people. But God gives grace to the humble. Here's a verse. I share this verse all the time. I don't know if I've shared it from the pulpit or not, but if so, try and stay awake. For thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy, who we're talking about the exalted God. And he says this, I dwell on a high and holy place. We all know that, right? God resides in heaven, a high and holy place, a throne. But look where else he resides. He resides in a second place. I also dwell with the contrite and the lowly of spirit. And here's why. In order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. We as Christians have a choice to make. We can clothe ourselves with pride and find ourselves against God. Or we can clothe ourselves with humility and see the grace of God extended to us. Three applications. Easy applications. First one is elders. Shepherd, feed, lead, guard the flock. Get to know your flock. Set an example for your flock. Somebody once has said, and I, I think it's for the most part true, that a people, whether it's a family, a nation, a, a church, never rises above their leadership. Be an example on how to walk with Jesus Christ, how to love Jesus Christ. Don't lord it over your flock. Shepherd them willingly. Young men, Put yourselves under the authority of an elder, under the authority of the elders. Let them be your mentors, your teachers. Learn from them. And someday, maybe the Holy Spirit will appoint you to run the church and to do a better job at it. And I hope that's the case. But put yourself under the elders. God has put them over you. Congregation, Know that your elders are a gift given to you by God. They'll walk with you in your suffering. Later on in this uh, section, I'm assuming Pat's going to get to it next week, um, in verse 8, it says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The elders are there to help you walk through those times when you're battling and struggling with the evil one. Be humble to each other. Walk with humility. Be servants one of another. Let's worship. Are we ready? Maybe, maybe not. You want me to sing? Oh.